Okay. So I would like to thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to give a more uh, condensed matter oriented talk in this meeting. It will be at least more condensed matter oriented than the previous ones. But there will be some uh, tensor network inside. Uh, so I will talk about uh, the, um, how one can study the doping of you know, some categories of, of spin liquids with uh, PEPs. And that's a work uh, that we just submit, uh, put on the archive very recently, just a few days ago. Uh, so done in collaboration with Philippe Corbeau, Norbert Schur, and uh, Ignacio Sirac. Uh, so I will be mainly talking about that. But I would like to make the parallel with some uh, former work where we look at a different uh, thing, but still with a lot of uh, analogy. So here it's about superconductors, which have to do with breaking of a continuous U1 symmetry, which is the charge U1 symmetry. And the analogs are basically some magnetic system where the, actually the SZ symmetry, uh, the conservation of SZ symmetry around the uh, magnetic field direction is broken. So there is a clear uh, parallel between the two aspects. So I will start with some motivation. So uh, motivation is basically uh, the uh, trying to understand ITC superconductors. So it's a very old uh, problem from the uh, late 80s. So the materials have been discovered in 87. And these materials are basically two-dimensional strongly correlated systems on the square lattice. <coughs> so for the purpose of this talk, we just consider we have uh, a square lattice. And the phase diagram is the following. So we have temperature and we have some axis, which is the stoichiometry of the material, which correspond to the doping of uh, a MOT insulator. So x equals zero correspond to a MOT insulator, <coughs> which means I have uh, one particle per site on average. And at this point, I have only basically, uh, only on this point, I have only spin degrees of freedom in the problem. So I can consider you know, that I have a, some energy scale for the charge excitation, which is the charge gap, which is very, very large compared to all, you know, um, um, all parameters in the problem, like the bandwidth or uh, the magnetic coupling constant. So I can forget about the charge degrees of freedom. And then I will change the circuitry of the material, and then I will introduce charge. So this is what we call doping. And now the charge history of charge degrees of freedom appear in the problem. And the goal is to uh, try to see whether we can uh, understand that with unique tensor network and how we can actually introduce these charge degrees of freedom into the problem, assuming we have uh, uh, a tensor network description for the MOT insulator. Okay, so that's basically the goal. So the question is, uh, can we, could uh, a small D uh, PEPs, let's say, describe uh, or give a reasonably good So that's not clearly defined, but description of, of the what happens. And of course, we are along this line. So we are really you know, targeting zero temperature thing. So really looking at the ground state property. Uh, so now it's, it's known that doping an antifor magnet is a compli complicated problem. And so far, we haven't really um, started to do that. So the hint to make things a little bit simpler and get a simpler starting point as an antifor magnet is basically to introduce magnetic frustration in the problem. So I want to introduce magnetic frustration. So it means I will have some other axes here. 
okay, which is ma magnetic frustration. So it will be, for example, the ratio of two magnetic coupling constant, which I call J1 over J2. So on the square lattice, it would correspond to you know, the ratio between this antiferromagnetic coupling constant and the antiferromagnetic coupling constant on the diagonal of the plaquette. Uh, and what is we expect, and actually it's known that this is the case, that if I am in the t equals zero plane, actually the antiferromagnetic order parameter goes away when I increase frustration. So there is a line here that goes to zero, basically. So when I get to some point, which is around j2 over j1 equal 0.5, which is here, then I get a uh, quantum disordered state, which is a spin liquid. So this point is a spin liquid. And this uh, state we can describe uh, with a very simple PEPS. Okay, so J2 over J1, when I increase it, I can stabilize a spin liquid, which we can describe as uh, a PEPS. And this PEPS is an RVB state, which I will define later. And we have a simple PEPS description, and actually it's very simple. It's d equal three uh, bond dimension. So it means we can basically calculate many things, even doing you no know, contraction exactly on small systems. Is this an exact statement that 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 this is the ground state of the exact ground state of that no, it's not the exact ground state, but you, it's, it's very, I mean, we have done, you know, simulation, computed energy, so it's very good energy, and you can refine it. Uh, I mean, there is a, we can construct a one-dimensional uh, family, you know, uh, one parameter family of states, uh, playing with the long-range, uh, you know, longer-range bonds, and we get very good energy comparable to what the MRG uh, gets for this J1, J2 model which I will define. So, so DMRG sees the plaquette BVS as the lowest state or the spin liquid in the most recent results? So uh, th there have been claims that uh, uh, it's a Z2, maybe a Z2 spin liquid. Yes. But this, I, I don't believe. I, I believe maybe you know there is some columnar phase. I mean, what happens on this side is complicated. But I believe here there is some columnar phase. And there is either a very narrow range where it's a topological spin liquid, or there is one point where it's just critical point. And our state, I will show you, but the, 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 the RVB state we are cons constructing as actually as critical uh, dimer correlation. So that's reasonably good starting point if we are just sitting at the critical point. So it would be a gapless spin liquid? It would be a gapless spin liquid, yeah, because we are on a bipartite lattice. And it's at the level of we believe that. Yeah, right, right. But I will show you, you know, comparison with more uh, elaborated uh, computation using iPads, for example, by uh, Philip. So. Okay. And the point is that even, you know, the, you might have a very crude uh, mod insulator here. The point is that when you dope, the state we are going to construct is going to be better, actually. That's a surprising fact, but uh, it's getting better and better, actually, on the dope. Uh, okay. So, uh, so what is the strategy, basically? Sorry, excuse me. Is this sure. gets better when you dope it? I didn't catch that word. What gets better when you dope the bond insulator? Uh, what's get, getting better when I dope is my ansatz. So I will start, you know, so this is, uh, I was going to, to say how I do it. So. Okay. So I will have an ansatz for x equals zero, which is RVB state. And then there is a very simple physical, you know, using physical intuition, basically, you can construct an ansatz uh, for the dope case. Okay. And when you compare to, for example, IPEPS calculation, uh, then you see that actually at finite doping, it's better than actually at zero doping. So I will show you a plot at the end if I have time to show you that. Um, so the strategy is the following. So we start, one, we start with um, or from the x equals zero RVB 
spin liquid. Okay. Um, and then what we have to do is we introduce charge degrees of freedom. So we have basically to enlarge the uh, physical fieldable space of the state. Okay, for x different from zero. Okay, but what we like to do is to do this, but keeping the bond dimension d fixed. Okay, because we might still uh, we might want to do you know calculations on uh, on finite systems uh, of reasonable size and uh, be able to uh, investigate properties of this state. And I will show you that actually we have a construction which does that. It's just enlarging the physical Hebrew space which is doping without doing anything to the bond dimension. So without introducing more entanglement in the, in the pipes. Uh, so that's basically the strategy. Now, now some remarks. <coughs> so first, first remark. Doping is not a small perturbation. And uh, for example, if I start with uh, a, spin, a spin liquid which has topological order, you know, like I would have on the Kagome lattice, for example, then if I dope, I will, in principle, immediately lose your topological character. So it's very related to what Bella was you know, explaining uh, this morning. Uh, like your know, temperature effect or doping effect are basically the same. Um, the other remark is that if I introduce charge degrees of freedom, okay, there is an emerging, I don't know whether I, sh I can write down or everybody can see or okay. Oh, okay, good. Uh, emerging U1 symmetry. Uh, which is actually associated to the conservation of the charge. Okay, so the charge U1 symmetry. And um, the symmetry actually can be broken and this is what we'll see in our ansatz. And so we get uh, a superconducting state. Which is exactly what it is. You know, U1 charge symmetry is broken, so we get a superconducting state. And this happens actually immediately when we introduce you new know, charge degrees of freedom in the problem, which is a nice thing about it. So this is really the idea of starting from the RDB here from the spin liquid that we can get immediately a superconductor. Well, if we would start from the antiferromagnet, we know that what happens you know, between the antiferromagnetic state at zero doping and uh, the superconducting state here is a complicated thing uh, that is much more difficult to describe. So here we believe it's much simpler what happens and there is basically a superconducting state that uh, basically originates from the underlying uh, pairing uh, contained in the RVB state. Uh, and the third point is um, that because we are introducing charge degrees of freedom, uh, then we have to uh, take into account fermionic statistics. So even though uh, we start with a bosonic uh, type of state at zero doping, when we have basically to uh, uh, introduce a fermion character, and the easiest way to do is basically to first rewrite the RVB state uh, in the insulator, in the insulating phase, uh, using the fermionic representation. And so then it would be very natural to extend the state uh, at finite doping. 
Okay, so that's basically the strategy. Uh, but before we do that, I would like to uh, first uh, discuss the uh, second part, which is actually simpler because here I, we don't, we're not dealing with extra degrees of freedom, like the charge degrees of freedom, and we are not, not, not also dealing with the fact that we have to introduce fermionic statistics. But there are many, uh, we can draw a parallel uh, with the previous problem. So what I will try to uh, do first is to look at what I call the magnetic analog. So, so the idea is basically that, for example, if I consider a system of spin one half, for example, a frustrated magnet, uh, I can use the odd core boson representation of my spin. Okay, so I will say, for example, zero boson would correspond to having spin up, one boson, which I obtain by applying this boson creation operator of this state would correspond to, uh, well, I use the other way. So spin down. So this one will correspond to spin up. And assume I uh, introduce a magnetic field, which uh, I say is, which I can choose along the z direction. Uh, then, uh, the Zeeman energy, which is minus h, sum of all the sides, s i z, in, in, can be written in the boson language as uh, you no know, chemical potential, which involves the density of bosons. Okay, so there is this basically. So when I will crank up the magnetic field, it's like you know changing the chemical potential and doping the system. Okay, so there is this uh, nice parallel. So now I have, again, a U1 symmetry in the problem, which is the conservation of the total magnetization along the Z direction. And that's you know, similar to the U1 symmetry, uh, which, is, which uh, you know, corresponds to the conservation of the total charge. Okay, so, um, <coughs> so this, the... Uh, Magnetization along the z direction, which I call m, is conserved. So it, can, it is defined by one over the number of sides, sum of all the side of expectation value of s i z. And what I expect if I start uh, from a uh, gapped uh, spin liquid. Uh, what I expect basically is to observe above some critical magnetic field uh, a phase transition. So this M will rise up to saturation, which in this case is one half. So all the spin will be up in the magnetic field. And uh, this state actually is a superfluid. Because this state actually breaks uh, also this U1 symmetry. So this is the analog actually of the superconductor. Uh, it's a superfluid, so it has a finite value of, the, uh, of this operator, of the Bose creation operator. And if now I translate back to the speed language, it means that the expectation value of SI plus will be different from zero. Okay, and SI plus, SI minus, I can make uh, the, that actually tell me that the spin component in the plane has a finite value. Okay, so I have basically a staggered, I will have, if I have a bipartite lattice, I will have a staggered magnetization transverse to the magnetic field direction. Okay, so, and that's really the analog of the superconducting state. And so this we can actually study, and I will give you an example. So I will start, uh, I will start with the, uh, uh, some Hamiltonian, like 
some SU2 environment Hamiltonian, which is, for example, the AKRT Hamiltonian. To make it simple, and I will uh, start with the hexagonal lattice. Okay, so assume I have an hexagonal AKRT Hamiltonian on the hexagonal lattice. So here I I'm dealing with actually spin three half here, and the Hamiltonian would just be the sum over all nearest neighbor bonds of the projector on those bonds uh, to the uh, spin three. Okay, so that's the usual AKRT construction. And then I will add some magnetic field. Okay, so this, this term, the Zeman coupling. So, so for this part, we know how to construct the PEPs. It's a very simple, it's a D equal to uh, PEPs. And then I will uh, construct some simple ansatz to understand you know, how you go with the magnetic field. Uh, so maybe I will show some size. Okay, so, so this is basically the left hand side. So I have my hexagonal lattice and uh, the PEPS construction is very, is actually very simple. Uh, so I have to introduce this ancilla state. Uh, so here I will have on every, every side which are spin 3 half, I break it in 3 spin 1 half. And then the uh, AKLT construction is identical to actually the PEPS construction. So I will consider the maximally entangled state, which are the singlets on the bones. And then uh, the ansatz is obtained by applying a projection on these, uh, uh, on the sides that maps this uh, uh, virtual space onto the uh, physical space, which is the spin 3 half. Okay, so it, it is the max, the, the completely symmetric, it maps it to the completely symmetric subspace. So that's my ansatz for zero magnetic field. And I can also consider something uh, which will uh, be of interest uh, later, uh, which is the, now the, on the same lattice, but now it's, it's a spin one half RVB state. And I have a, a construction which is very similar. Uh, so the PEPS construction for the RVB, so what is the RVB first? The RVB is basically considering that every spin one half, so now these are spin one half, every spin one half on the side is actually part of a dimer. Okay, so on every side there is a, a dimer. So there is dimers between all the sides of the lattice. And the RVB is just a linear superposition of all of them with the same weight. So this is equal weight superposition of these nearest neighbor singlet coverings. Uh, and it turns out that on this bipartite lattice, it is critical. Okay, so it has long range dimer-dimer correlation, although it has short range spin-spin uh, correlation. So, so the construction now, the PEPS construction is very similar. So I have now to introduce uh, another virtual state which is a two state, okay? So it's now it's a D equal three state to represent the fact that on some of the bonds, there are no singlets, okay? So now on these, the, project, the projector actually maps these uh, three states here of the ancillas onto now the spin one half instead of this case where I had a, a spin three half. But otherwise it's very similar, okay? So now I can look at what happens if I add the magnetic field and can I come up with a very simple description. Uh, so how are we going, by the way, how are we going to deal with these uh, states? Uh, well, well the, the aim is basically to do uh, calculation with these PEPs. And so our general uh, scheme is to put these uh, PEPs on a cylinder and since the uh, virtual space is, is uh, has a small dimension d, we can basically do exact construction. We can also use, you know, appro approximate scheme, but what is nice is that we can basically, for cylinders which are not too large, but which are similar to what DMRG people use, you know, typically six, eight, or ten unit cell in the transverse direction, we can actually do exact construction and compute, you know, observable for those states. And what is nice also is that we can basically consider the limit 
where the length of the cylinder is infinite. Because the way to do it is uh, to, uh, so, so what, what, what we do basically is we construct the, the double layer uh, uh, peps, you know, taking the ket and the bra. And so this we do on a, first on a, on a column here. So that gives a transfer matrix. So we contract the physical indices. We get the transfer matrix. And then we can iterate the transfer matrix from left to right up to infinity. So basically, we have finite size effect only in the transverse direction, but we get rid of the finite size effect in the longitudinal direction. That's basically the, the scheme. Um, so now we, this is what we are going to use to compute uh, observables. And so, uh, so how are we, am I going to extend my uh, uh, PEPs to account for the effect of the magnetic field? Actually, it's very easy. So in the case of the AKLT, uh, one simple, very simple construction, uh, keeping the bond dimension the same, that is two, is just consider that because of the magnetic field, uh, I uh, will have a mixture of the, uh, of the singlet with the one-one component of the triplet, which is around the magnetic field. Okay, and beta will be a variational parameter that will depend on the magnetic field and then we can adjust. Okay. It looks a very crude, but I will show you actually comparison with Langshaw's exaggerization. We show that this ansatz is extremely good. Now what would happen for the uh, RVB case? Uh, for the RVB case, it, it's kind of different. We know that if we, uh, the magnetic field will like to promote, for example, some of the bonds, some of the single bonds into triplets. But actually we know that in such a state, uh, the excitation of fractional excitation. So it means if I make a triplet excitation, then they will like to fractionalize, like in basically in one dimension. <coughs> and so basically uh, I will end up with, you know, spin one half excitation, which are spin on excitation. So this we, uh, we can actually uh, include at the level of the, uh, of the PEPs. And so what we do is we simply add a new projector okay, to the state. So uh, now we consider that we have a projector, P1, which is a spin-on projector, uh, that actually uh, maps uh, you know, three, uh, three uh, two state into uh, uh, spin one half, which is polarized <laughs> along the magnetic field. Uh, so maybe I can write this down to make a uh, curve, maybe. So, um, so for the RVB, what I do is I basically I take uh, the usual uh, RVB projector, okay, for zero magnetic field, and I add uh, a new piece, so lambda P1. So that corresponds to adding new t uh, tensor elements on the <coughs> side. And this P1 is basically equal to uh, this projection. So it basically starts with three ancillas, uh, which are in the two states, okay, which means there's no dimers on the bonds, and then project it on a spin one half, which is in the direction of the magnetic field. So that's exactly a spin on. That's the crudest thing you can think of to, uh, to write a spin on. Um, and so the nice thing is that basically uh, you have the same bone dimension okay, in these, in these ansatz, uh, which is the first point. And the second point is just by construction, you break the U1 symmetry. Uh, 
associated to the conservation of AZ. Okay, that, so that's clear here. I mean, this, this clearly is a, is a mixture between a singlet on the bone with a triplet component. Okay, so you break the U1 symmetry uh, in this uh, <coughs> in these ansatz. So you expect to have to see some transverse magnetization which correspond to some, to some superfluid other parameter okay, for, for this problem. So it's, it's the same as the superfluid other parameter. Okay, yes. So, so then you get an answer to PEPS which is transmission invariant by construction? Right. And which breaks the symmetry by construction? That's right. So it's not a prediction, it's not a result of an optimization, this is just... The right, except you have to optimize for uh, every magnetic field, you have to, uh, you know, you have a family of, of yes. PEPs. So for every magnetic field, uh, you have this beta parameter in one case, or you have this lambda parameter in the other case. So there would be a function of the magnetic field. So there is an optimization at this level. You, know, you have a one parameter family. Right, but only for lambda equal to zero, you will get no breaking of, of U1. Symmetry. That's right, that's right. So immediately, as soon as you turn, turn on this land, uh, the lambda or beta, you will get uh, this superfluid uh, density. OK? And uh, so, so let me just show you how good it is for, for, for the case of the AKLT on the Tonian. Uh, so what we show here is the uh, energy per site as a function of the magnetization. Okay, so so the, the magnetic field, you know, if I have the energy is written as this energy per site, okay, minus the magnetic field times the magnetization, and this guy is a function of the magnetization along the field. Okay, so <coughs> so to get the magnetization as a function of field, you have to do a Legendre transform. Okay, so this is your usual thing. So basically, you minimize this for a given field with respect to the magnetization, and what you get is that the magnetic field is minus the derivative of the energy, uh, which in this case is the AKLT energy, with respect to the magnetization. Okay, so if I give you this curve, which is the energy per site as a function of reduced magnetization, then I can draw the uh, uh, magnetization curve, that is magnetization versus magnetic field, which is the curve I draw, uh, I've drawn before, okay, which I erased, unfortunately. Okay. So what 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 uh, what uh, what data do we plot here? So we plot uh, long chance excitation on six feet site. So it's it's not an easy calculation because we have four states per site, you know, like Herbert. So so they're like four to the sixteen state in the other space, so it's rather big. But nevertheless, we can do it using you know symmetries. And these are the dots here. Yeah. Okay. And the, uh, the other points are the ansatz, okay, the green points and the pink points. And, and they are actually quite good for such a crude you know, ansatz. Uh, and so from, from this equation, you can get the critical field because the critical field uh, corresponds to the initial slope here for zero magnetization. Okay, so the slope here goes linear and the slope is a critical field. And the critical field we find for the, uh, from the excitonization is actually very close to the critical field we find with using this uh, ansatz, considering the fact that it's just a simple D equal to ansatz. Yes? What's the difference between the, the green and the purple? I do not understand. Okay, I didn't want to go into, the too, into too much detail, but we have actually two parameters. So, so we're not only mixing the uh, the triplet on the bones, but we're also introdu introducing some, uh, we are also increasing the bone dimension. There is a little more complicated than that, but it's just a bit technical, but it doesn't do much. Uh, you know, the, the, 
these data are just with the ansatz I show you, the, the, these, these uh, purple points. <coughs> okay, so, so just to show you that it's doing uh, uh, well, considering the, uh, you know, the, the simple nature of the, on the ansatz. And of course, what we find is, and we can calculate it uh, on infinite cylinders, is the uh, uh, transverse magnetization, which you correspond to this uh, superfluid order parameter as a function of the reduced magnetization. And you see that as soon as the magnetization is non zero, then we have a uh, superfluid density, which has this, this form. And we can calculate it uh, in the, uh, in this, with this formalism. OK. Uh, so now I would like to come back to my first motivation, which is the uh, charge doping. So you will see that it is actually very similar, and we can borrow you know, for the construction of the doped RVB, we can borrow some of the ideas that we have here in this, in this construction for the uh, doped RVB, uh, for the magnetic, magnetically doped RVB. Okay, so, so just to give an idea of what we are interested in, we, we can, uh, so what we do basically is we have doping here, okay? We have uh, frustration. And uh, as a function of frustration, so basically this one for non frustrating, the, the non frustrating system has antiferromagnetic, long range antiferromagnetic order. And as I was telling you, this is killed by the frustration. So for uh, frustration of for around 0.5. And then the idea now is to see what happens you know, if I start from this point and I uh, dope the system. So, so the Hamiltonian I'm going to consider as a guide. Okay, It's, it's basically uh, J1, what we call J1, J2 uh, T model, or so which is just the antiferromagnetic coupling along the nearest neighbor and next nearest neighbor bond. So I have this parameter J1 for nearest neighbor and J2 for next nearest neighbor. And then I'm going to consider that some of the sides are diluted. Okay, so there's basically holes or empty sides. Okay, and so these are the charge degrees of freedom and these charge degrees of freedom can actually delocalize on the lattice so I will have some hopping term associated to them. So there is a term, a hopping term, which is like the usual uh, time binding form. But now what is new here is that I, have strong, I assume I have very strong correlation on the sides. So if an electron hops on the adjacent side, I don't want it creates a doubly occupied side because that costs an enormous energy. Okay, so an electron can hop on a given side only if there is a hole next to it. Okay, and so I have to introduce some projector to guarantee this, which is called the Gutzilla projector. And this projector formally is just given by the product. You can write it as a product on all the sides of one minus ni up ni down. Okay, so each time I have a configuration which on a one side has a doubly occupied side, this projector just gives me zero. Okay, so that guarantees that my Hilbert space has no doubly occupied side. So it's like a TJ model? It's a TJ model, but where I have used frustration. So it's like a TJ1, J2 model, if you want. Okay. Uh, <coughs> so what I will do is. Uh, I will start, how much time do you have? 15 minutes, a little more. So I will start 
with uh, the bosonic RDB state at x equals 0. So by, by RVB, I mean uh, the state. So now I am on the square lattice. I'm no longer on the hexagonal lattice. And by RVB, I mean the equal weight superposition of the odd core uh, valence bond covering. Okay, so I have a construct configuration when on every, for where every side has a dimer attached to it. Okay, so on every side, I will have a dimer like that, and this is empty, this is empty. Okay? So that's a constraint. Every side there is a, a dimer and a single one. And what I have to do is, I will have to introduce charge degrees of freedom, which are fermionic. So what I'm going to do is to rewrite the RVB state in the fermionic representation. So I get the same state, but now I will use uh, uh, F-PEPs. To, to write it. So it's exactly the same state, but a different representation. And then now when I have rewrite it in the uh, fermionic representation, I can just simply take out particles, okay? So that would be a simple generalization. So I can immediately uh, introduce charge degrees of freedom. So this is really essential. I rewrite my state in the fermionic representation, even for x equals 0. Um, so um, So, so the RVB state, let me write it again. So this is the sum on configurations uh, like, like that. So, so I have a lot of qualities. And I construct my balance bond configuration like that. And I sum over them with the same equal weight and equal sign, plus one everywhere. Uh, and we know that this can be represented, as I explained, uh, with the d equals 3 uh, peps, with the bond dimension 3. And now I have only physical dimension 2, okay, spin up and spin down on every side. So, uh, what I will, uh, so, so the, the tensor are basically like, like this, no? I mean, if I have tensor very simple, so on three of the bones, I have uh, the two state, and on one of the bones, I have zero, either a zero or one that correspond to a spin up or spin down on the physical index. So that's my projector, okay? That's as simple as that. Then I want to rewrite this in terms of the fermion. So what does it mean? It means basically that uh, I have to, to create these dimers. I can introduce, rewrite the operator that create the dimers in terms of fermions. So I will write it as, so this is i and j. I will write it as ci up dagger cj up dagger plus Cj uh, up dagger Ci. So there is a down. Sorry, Ci down dagger. That's my singlet operator, which now in the Fermi representation is symmetric. So this is Fji. Okay. So while here I have to use a convention. You know, in the bosonic representation, I have basically to use a convention from A to B sub lattice because this guy is up, down, minus, down, up. 
and so it is anti-symmetric with respect to the reflection. Okay, but now in the fermion, I don't need to do that anymore. Okay, it just it becomes symmetric. But the price I have to pay if I use this, I basically uh, introduce some sign in the wave function. And the way uh, to see this, the uh, easiest way is basically to consider you know, a simple uh, RVB configuration on four sides. Okay, I take four sides and I write the configura this configuration. Okay, so, so in the bosonic representation, I have some arrows. So let's say I have this guy plus this guy, okay? <coughs> you can check that if you rewrite this in terms of this operator, basically you will get this. So now I don't have any more arrows because it's symmetric. Minus this, okay? So if I rewrite this wave function in terms of this new fermionic operator, okay, I have a very non-trivial sign that appears here, okay? And so how do we fix this sign? The, 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 the answer is very simple. To fix this sign, we can just say that minus one is just equal to I squared, okay? And so what I will do is each time I have, uh, so I think maybe there is a minus here and a plus here. So here, well, it depends what convention you choose, but assume there is a minus here. So this is I squared. And so what I do is basically I split this minus sign in terms of the two bones. So each time I have a vertical bone in my configuration, I put an I. Okay, so I can write plus and then I and I. Okay. So that and, and this will automatically take care of the uh, of the minus sign. So I can use the F peps now, introducing the uh, saying that you know each up and down spin are actually electrons with up and down spin and they are fermions now. And so I can use all the technology which have been uh, developed for, uh, to construct F, uh, F peps. So I build a transparency from Philippe where he cites you know, all the works. So probably I get there are many people here uh, who participated to uh, setting this up. Um, and so we're gonna just use the one of this formulation and include this I here. So one gets exactly the same state, but now it's written in the, in the fermion representation. Okay, and so now it's very easy to, uh, to dope. So now we have the RVB liquid written in terms of fermions. Which is, yes? So if you had not done that, if you just take the fermionic representation without right. the eyes, is that a good answer for If I have what? If you just... Ah, no, no, the energy is very bad. It's very bad. Yeah. If you forget about the eye, you may put a plus sign right. and then you use fermion, then it's awful. And it, do you understand why one works better than the other? One, so... Well, because it's intrinsically a, a bosonic problem at half feeling, no? So, uh -huh. so... It's a low energy. Well, for, no, you, you can you can look at you know the what what the Heisenberg Hamiltonian does. Yeah, maybe the answer is the following. The simplest answer is you take four sides and you look at what the Heisenberg Hamiltonian does on the singlet, and that actually it's is doing this you know flip of the dimers with a plus sign. So you can you check that. Minus sign, you take the energy. Exactly. Yeah. Right. So you can understand it at the level of the plaquette of the resonance of the plaquette. Maybe. Uh, I think it follows, yeah, it follows the Marshall sign, yes, yes. 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 Right. Well, but, you know, as soon as you, you, you add frustration here, you, in principle, you should not, I mean, there's no reason why you should have the Marshall sign. But it turns out, I think, the, this wave function fulfills the Marshall sign. But it need not, in principle. Um, okay, so... So this is what we, we start with that, okay? So now there is an I everywhere, and this is the FPEPS. There is no orientation of the, of the bonds. And we think of you know, introdu introducing doping. So basically, what we can do, I mean, simply, is just to take out some sides, okay? Uh, so I can introduce some tensor that correspond to that, uh, which is very, very simple. 
that correspond to the, the hole. So that, that would be basically some tensor. Uh, so I will have some new projector. I'm doing li like you know the previous example. So I'm taking P0, and then I would add some lambda times P1. And this projector correspond to this tensor element, where here I have a new physical state, which is this two state. So these two, these are the empty, you know, the vacant site, if you want, the holes. And then I say that there is no there is no singlets around it, okay. And so I would have two here for the virtual indices. So that's a new projector. I can just make, you know, extend the Hilbert space into the holes and add this uh, and add this uh, projector. Okay. So if naively this is what you would do, but the, the problem is that if you do that, uh, you can when you calculate the expectation value of this term, the kinetic term, okay? So in this wave function, where you have just added this piece, you find that the kinetic energy is just zero. And this is exact. And why is it zero? It is zero basically because uh, this operator wants to move the hole to the next place so by, by one along the near assembly bond. And if you want to move the holes here, basically you have to uh, create uh, a singlet on the diagonal of the uh, diagonal of the plaquette. Okay? And it turns out that this new configuration is orthogonal to all the configuration of my RVD state. This you can prove. It's, it's very easy because that involves an infinitely long stream uh, of that, that gives an orthogonality with all the previous state. So it means that if I really want to describe that, I have to be a little more uh, clever, and I have to include some configuration where, in the vicinity of the holes, I have some longer range bonds. Okay, so basically this is what we are doing. With this projector here, I will add some other projector, so with some coefficient c, which is a virtual parameter, times a projector P2. And this projector actually, uh, so I will not write it explicitly, but what it does is that it includes configuration where uh, it's the vicinity of a hole, I have longer range bonds. You know, so this type of configuration, or you know, all the symmetric ones, like that, and so on. And it also has some configuration where if I have a hole here, I will have a, a singlet that goes above the hole. Okay, so this is what this projector does. And it has, you no, know, I, I don't need to extend the bond dimension. You can construct this by uh, <coughs> keeping the bond dimension d equals 3 fixed. Okay, it's, uh, that's very easy. So at basically no price, you can construct this wave function. So, so the singlet internally goes through that side, the singlet that is crossing. For instance, the first new addition that it's, you have? Yes. So it's a, in, internally, it's going through the internal. It, exactly. It's some kind of teleportation thing. You, know? you, can, you can include uh, by, by, by uh, saying that if I have a 0 here, I can have a 1 here, basically. And so that guarantees. And so, so now there is this issue about the respective weight of, of those, but we figured out what, what it should be. Okay. So, so if you do that, you have basically a one parameter family of state, and you can optimize with respect to this parameter. Okay, so if you increase C, then you can actually uh, get lower and lower kinetic energy. And, uh, and then you have this parameter lambda, which is actually like a chemical potential that tunes the whole density. Okay, so you have one version parameter to lower the energy and another parameter to tune the uh, density of holes. Okay, so that's basically the idea, at basically no price. Okay. And so, uh, since I don't have much time, maybe I'll show you the, the results. So that's basically you know, the type of configuration we introduce. Okay. And uh, 
So what we computed is, uh, so this is computed on infinite cylinders, which have six or eight you know, unit, uh, unit cells in the, uh, the transverse direction. And uh, this is as a function of doping, and this is the kinetic energy per hole. So this is something that we know from exagonization. You know, in the old days, we know what should be the kinetic energy per hole when you dope a mod insulator. And that's basically of the order of minus 2t per hole. Okay, so that's the number that comes out from the Langshaw's calculations more closely. So this we can reproduce. I mean, when we increase the parameter c, you see that here the kinetic energy per hole is getting as low as minus 2.5t. And we know that this is the right order of magnitude, basically. So the simple ansatz can, can understand, can, can reproduce that. Um, and so the last point uh, uh, we need to understand is basically what's the nature of the uh, what the nature of the phase we have here. Okay, and uh, basically uh, what we find is that this state is a superconductor. So how can we see that? So the first hint that we have a superconductor is coming from the fact that uh, we can define another parameter for it. <coughs> And we can actually change the phase of the superconducting order parameter by playing with the, uh, with the phase of the chemical potential in the ansatz. So wh wh what does it mean? It means that I can define a superconducting pairing, which is the expectation value of CI, let's say up, CJ down. Okay. So that's typically two sides on nearest neighbor position or next nearest neighbor position. And this is a singlet operator. So that corresponds to a couple pair in the system. Okay. And this thing is different from zero uh, just by construction. Okay. And you can see that we can actually change the phase of this guy in the wave function. So why is that? Because I have a projector so which is P0 plus lambda times P1 plus CP2. And uh, the, this guy basically maps on a state which has a spin. And these two projectors map on states which have a hole. OK, so if I change the phase of lambda to lambda I phi, in fact, you can convince yourself that you will change the phase of this uh, expectation value by uh, we go into exponential 2 i phi uh, times delta i j. Okay, so that's the explicit u1 symmetry breaking in the uh, in the FX. Okay, so, so the phase here is that you introduce in the, the PEPs correspond actually to the superconducting phase of your superconductor. Okay. So that's very easy to, just by construction. Um, so what you can do with that, you can do uh, all sorts of things. For example, you can calculate how the uh, superconducting order parameter appears as a function of uh, how much time do you have? Two minutes? Yeah, we started a bit late, so. Two minutes, maybe? <laughs> yeah. So how the superconducting order parameter appears as a function of doping. So what you see that it basically it appears immediately when you dope the system. It appears immediately at any finite uh, doping. So you can even try to fit the uh, dependence of the superconducting pairing amplitude. So this is what I showed here. So this is a pairing amplitude on the nearest neighbor sides. And you see that basically it goes like a square root of the, of the doping. So the different curves correspond to different parameters C. 
that we have in the ansatz. And what you see also is that there is a next nearest neighbor component. So there is pairing on the next nearest neighbor sites. And you can also make a orbital, you know, you could compute the orbital symmetry of your other parameter and see that actually the other parameter has the D wave component. So that's in the old, you know, mean field RVB. That's what was coming out. But the, the new point is that there is a small imaginary component that we get here, uh, which has S wave symmetry. So, so this guy is very small compared to this one, but we can argue that it should still be there because basically it is contained, you know, it originates from the RVB in the MOT insulator because the RVB in the MOT insulator has this factor I on the vertical bond. And so there is this hidden, you know, uh, mixed symmetry S plus ID or D plus IS, D plus IS symmetry that is hidden in the uh, insulating RDB. So what I mean by Eden is that there is no superconducting amplitude in the insulator, of course, but there is this phase factor between the horizontal bond and the vertical bond. So as soon as you dope, then the superconductor basically inherits from this uh, D plus IS symmetry of the insulator. So, so, so basically there, there should be this small component and this is a time you know, reversal symmetry breaking component which might have some, you know, Application in the, the, the real material, but it's it, it's actually very small, so we don't know actually whether it's physical or, or not. Uh, so maybe uh, some out uh, outlook is that now we, what we would like to do is basically to uh, try to understand what would happen if we dope the antiferromagnet. So can we actually extend this construction to the antiferromagnetic case, uh, which is harder, but we know how to construct actually uh, the PEPs for the uh, Antiferromagnet, and what would happen now if I dope on this on this line? And uh, that's the next uh, problem. To be interested in. Okay. Thank you very much. So, so let's see. You've presented the answer, which has. It's a superconductor. It's built into the ansatz. Yes. And in, in some particular, in the line of, um, what, what was that? When you had zero you know, doping. Yes. Then you have, you really have that in the ansatz. Yes. Um, do oh, you have I, I forgot to answer one of the questions uh, that was asked. I said it's better when it's doped. And so we have actually comparison with IPEPs, which I forgot to show. Okay. But this is the last slide, actually. And so these are the IPEPs calculation from Philippe, uh, which are the blue, uh, the blue dots. And these are the, our ANSATs, which are these, these points. So you see that they are actually, if you start from a random configuration and you do the, you know, you do the simple update uh, uh, algorithm with the same bond dimension, oh, D equals sorry. three, then you never manage to reach the, you know, the energy of the ANSATs. But is it with U1 symmetry? Is, is that? Is, is not using any any particular uh, constraint. I think he's using random initial condition and so um, he's, he has a more general answer than yours. Yeah, because he he's starting uh, and he never managed to get down to uh, to uh, to my ansatz for all the points except at half filling. But is it is it okay. correct to say that if he had the proper update, if he managed to optimize properly, he would match? I hope so, but so what he did, no, but what he did is he uses, he put, he, yeah, but there is another thing that he put, you know, he uses my ansatz, you know, as a starting point of his IPEPs thing, and and he tried to optimize it further, and he never managed, you know, so these are the, the, the green dots here, which are obtained by taking as an initial configuration the ansatz we have, and then trying to optimize it further, and you see that it's basically on the same line, okay? So, so it, it's, it means it's an optimal, I think it's an very close to the optimal state for D equals three. Or, or maybe this is a statement about simple update, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, if you go to full method. update, right. 
this will probably change. I mean, we know that there are cases where simple update goes very Okay, th this, this seems to be an example. Yeah, okay. Has, has he tried full update? Mm, not yet. I think there is a technical complication, which is the thing that we have to deal with longer range uh, magnetic interaction. Oh, there's no full update for the diagonal. Well, then maybe you, you can you can set it up, but I think no, it's, it's, it's really hard to do a full update if you have yeah, diagonal. probably harder to do it. Yes, right. yes. Yeah, for technical and once once he goes to the equal to six and he beats the energy, I mean, yeah, this is what you saw. Yeah. But qualitatively, yeah. is there any? It's a completely different state. So so these those states are kind of of um, uh, charge order. You know, it it has it, there are non-uniform state. So so uh, I'm not I'm not gonna. You know, be a st yeah. supporter of simple update, but you're saying that there is uh, no, no. that so state with lower <coughs> energy, which are completely different. Yeah, no, no. But what he says is that you know, if you do this simple update and you try to crank up the bond dimension, then eventually this charge order thing, you know, the fact that it's non-uniform, will disappear. So, so that's an artifact of the IPEPs at, at small d, small bond dimension that you get a state which is non-uniform. But I think it will it will go it will go away when you increase the bond dimension. But the energies also will keep dropping. Yeah, yeah. Or as expected, but... Uh, I mean, these differences are pretty big, right? It's like 10 percent. Here? I mean, here? Yeah. yeah it's these are energetics for some T, J, J prime model. That's right. That, that's exactly the parameter. Yeah. That's right. You know, this is for this parameter. Right. This Oh, oh, point five. Yes, yes, as a function of x, which is this point. We should probably move on to the next part.